The following individuals have dedicated their lives to addressing the issues and answers surrounding pre-hospital ventilation. The goal of their message is to provide you with the facts. With this knowledge, you will better understand how to ventilate your patients. Richard J. Melker, American Heart Association, National Committee Chairman, Working Group on Ventilation. Paul M. Paris, Chief, Division of Emergency Medicine, University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Roger D. White, Member American Heart Association, National Faculty Advanced Cardiac Life Support. Paul E. Pepe, American Heart Association, National Faculty Member for Advanced Cardiac Life Support. Michael J. Banner, Member, American Heart Association, Subcommittee on Ventilation Standards. What you're about to witness will give you the straightforward, documented medical reasons why you will soon be changing the most time-honored procedures of ventilating patients. Recommended by the American Heart Association, field-tested by paramedics, and research supported by doctors throughout the country, these procedures are breakthroughs in pre-hospital ventilation technology. This scene describes your life. At a moment like this, you are the standard of care. The man and woman in the car are dependent upon you. At this moment, you are all they have to count on. You and the reliability of your equipment. The purpose of this video is twofold. First, to show you how the equipment and procedures you've chosen may, in fact, be inadequate and improperly used, thus adversely affecting the survival of the patient. And second, to provide you with documentation of how new technology can and will improve your ability to provide safe and adequate ventilation to your patients. You know better than anyone the dangers inherent in transporting a critically ill patient. Improper ventilation can harm your patient, cause damage to the lungs, and interfere with the circulation of blood. In fact, the ability to ventilate a patient effectively is one of the most difficult tasks you are faced with at the scene and on your way to the hospital. We're fortunate that technology brings about change. And this change provides you with state-of-the-art equipment and techniques that enhance your abilities. But it hasn't always been that way for those in your profession. What you're seeing is a training film from the 50s. Notice the difficulty the nurse is having ventilating the patient and the expansion of the mouth and throat, wasting a significant volume of gas. But that was then. Today, you have more options. Safe and effective ventilation of children and adult patients requires an understanding of certain basic concepts concerning pulmonary physiology, as well as a knowledge of the effects artificial ventilation has on the function of the heart, lungs, and gas exchange. Every cell in the body needs oxygen. So providing oxygen is essential for life. You can't, cells cannot produce energy without oxygen. Ventilation is the process of getting rid of waste gases. Those gases that we consider have been produced from making energy, namely carbon dioxide. It's important to get rid of carbon dioxide because of the fact when it builds up, it has a variety of problems that occur, namely a change in the pH of the body, which needs to be in narrow ranges, and then subsequent problems that can occur due to the acidosis or the buildup of CO2. So we need to consider them separately because they're two different processes. We now are finding that the thing that's such a key issue, no matter what area you're talking about, whether it's cardiac arrest or trauma, is airway management, oxygenation, and ventilation. And we're really just fine tuning that uh, in, in basically on a widespread basis. Uh, in fact, these aren't really new things. These are things we've known about for 20 or 30 years. We're really trying to emphasize it because it will really optimize patient care if we really understand the principles better. People confuse a large movement of the lung with adequate ventilation. 
When one goes up to the intensive care unit and sees a patient on a ventilator, the chest doesn't move nearly as much as the way we're taught to do it on mannequins. The following are examples from research documentation which support this new focus on ventilation and the need for change. Even the best CPR compressions are futile unless the rescuer is able to maintain an airway and ventilate the patient with an adequate volume of high concentration oxygen. More than 50% of the EMTs were not capable of ventilation the minimum standard using a bag valve mask. Both emergency department physicians and pre-hospital personnel ventilated with average tidal volumes below those currently accepted in ACLS standards. Without exception, these studies indicate it is not the length of transport time, but the quality of manual ventilation based on the skill of the person and type of equipment used that directly affect the survival of the patient. If you go out uh, and see the day-to-day -day usage of the bag valve mask, it's really not been done very well. As an anesthesiologist, I think I can say with confidence that very few people can use a bag valve mask device effectively in difficult circumstances, which are very frequent in pre-hospital care. So people wind up with two hands struggling to secure a mask seal and a fit and with one remaining hand to squeeze a, a volume of gas into the, hopefully, into the lungs. And it's very difficult. I think we have, for most people at least, we have to find an alternative to that method of ventilation. In the streets where the patient is bleeding, who's hypotensive, who's in shock, who you have many priorities, it's unrealistic to think that they're actually delivering adequate ventilation and adequate oxygenation. What you're seeing is actual footage of what can happen to a patient during the rigors of paramedic treatment and transport. As you can see, the paramedic is rapidly squeezing the bag mass resuscitator in order to hyperventilate the patient. Circumstances require him to stop ventilation at intervals. But this is not restricted to field maneuvers alone. Patients can experience similar trauma even in the relatively more stable conditions of a hospital. When the patient leaves the emergency department and goes to an intensive care unit or an operating room, sometimes in a rather lengthy journey, maybe with stops in the x-ray department or elsewhere, uh, the certainty that ventilation is being maintained adequately, I think, is a problem that is of equal importance there. If lives were not at stake, this problem might be dismissed as simply not meeting some theoretical standard. However, study after study continues to show that in response times of 6 to 12 minutes unintentional hypoventilation occurred in non-intubated patients. For intubated patients, hyperventilation was a common occurrence, even in the hands of the most skilled, well-schooled operators. What is needed and being recommended as the new standard by the American Heart Association is an automatic transport ventilator which allows for the independent control of delivered tidal volumes and the selection of appropriate respiratory rates. When people use a bag valve mask, they squeeze the bag so fast that they don't allow the gas to distribute well in the lung. And when they use the demand valves where they push the button and those demand valves are not restricted to slow flow rates, the same thing happens. The gas does not distribute equally in the lung. And we found in those studies that the best way to ventilate somebody is with an automatic transport ventilator because it always provides a nice, slow breath with exactly the proper rate and tidal volume. In this program, you will be observing four different devices used to provide ventilatory support. Each will be evaluated on its ability to deliver effective ventilation. You will recognize each of them as tools of your trade. And because your major concern is patient care, we ask you to keep an open mind as the inherent problems associated with these devices are demonstrated. We wanted to evaluate how rescue people, such as paramedics, EMTs, and respiratory therapists ventilated in a scenario similar to a patient who is not intubated. So we set up a model for them to ventilate the model 
And we studied how they ventilated using a bag valve mask and mouth to mask and an oxygen powered demand valve and an automatic transport ventilator. In fact, uh, most providers uh, basically were not providing uh, ventilation properly with bag valve masks because they didn't understand many of these principles. That the, uh, the emphasis on rate of delivery, um, the oral airway, the positioning of the head, all those things were not being done properly. We found that they were most able to reproduce the same tidal volume and rate over time by using the automatic transport ventilator. And it was only with the automatic transport ventilator that all of the gas went into the lung and none of the gas went into the stomach. With all four of these devices, there are considerations well beyond just ventilating. We met with Dr. Michael Banner, assistant professor of anesthesiology and physiology at the University of Florida College of Medicine. This is a model of an adult patient in which we'll demonstrate the distribution of ventilation between the lungs and the stomach. Uh, this is a head of a recessa ante, and the trachea of the head is directed to the two bronchi, which are inflating the lungs, as you can see here as I move it. The uh, Penrose drain is acting as the esophagus, and connected to the esophagus is the lower esophageal sphincter. And here we're using a water column valve set at 15 centimeters of pressure, the normal critical opening pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter. That in turn is directed to a spirometer which is acting as our stomach. Now what I'm going to have you do is use a series of devices here to ventilate our patient and pick up the self-inflating bag which is attached to a mask and by the way as you know this is an unintubated patient, a patient with an unprotected airway. So what I'll have you do is attach the mask to the face squeeze the bag and give a volume into the lungs and give it a pretty good squeeze here because we want to show yeah go ahead okay squeeze it again and you'll see that some of the volume is going into the stomach excuse me the lungs but you can see a pretty good portion is also being distributed into the stomach go, go through it again on the when I give this a good squeeze why does it go into the stomach? Okay, you're generating a very high inspiratory flow rate, and when you generate high inspiratory flow rates, the result and effect is a high pressure that's generated. When the pressure exceeds the critical opening pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter, which is 15 centimeters of water, the gas then preferentially starts filling the stomach. So the problem is we have to ventilate our patient with a lower flow rate to generate lower pressures. We have here two demand flow valves. One is a high flow valve and one is a low flow valve. And the high flow valve will put out a peak flow rate of 120 liters per minute. So let's attach that to the face. And again, push the button and let's see if we can inflate our lungs here and uh, just uh, attach it properly. Get a good seal there on the face, okay? okay? And push the button and let's just direct. Okay, you'll notice, uh, yeah, you notice the lungs are filling, but look at the stomach. The stomach is just loading up as we uh, push the button there. How would I know how, how long to push this? What am I looking for? You really for? don't. What we teach as uh, taught is the chest wall should, chest should rise and fall uh, adequately. But the problem is not only is the chest wall rising and falling, but the stomach is also filling with air, as you can clearly see. But let's use a low flow demand valve. And this one puts out approximately 40 liters per minute. Let's just reset the stomach here. Okay, let's try it again. Let's try to give a breath to our patient. Let's get a good seal and push the okay, button. Just push it. Sure. And you'll notice all the volume is going into the lungs now, and zero volume is being directed into the stomach. And in this uh, scenario, I've got a one-way valve here, and you're going to blow into this valve, and we'll attach that to the patient's face. Okay. So let's just blow vigorously into it and try to get the lungs inflated. And not only are you inflating the lungs, but notice the, uh, the stomach going right up as well. Okay, the last uh, piece of equipment we'll use is an automatic or portable ventilator. This is the uh, amount of breaths per minute, and I'll turn this to approximately 10 breaths per minute. It's in the adult setting, and the inspiratory time here is set at approximately two seconds. And I'm going to give our patient about a thousand milliliter tidal volume. So it's a pretty, pretty simple device to operate, and it's quite right. user friendly. So let's uh, now that that's preset, why don't you attach the mask to the face, and let's uh, let's take it again. 
And hold the mask back uh, on the chin there. Okay. Very good. Very good. And you notice you can hold two hands on the mask and get a much better seal. Notice all the gas is going into the lungs. No gas is going into the stomach. The ventilator is programmed to put out a low flow rate. Therefore, it generates a lower pressure, less than the critical opening pressure of the esophageal sphincter. And therefore, the gas goes into the lungs and not the stomach. In the new American Heart Association standards for ventilation, there are three important parameters. They are rate, or the number of breaths per minute delivered to the patient, the tidal volume, which is the actual volume of gas delivered, and the inspiratory time, which is the time it takes to deliver that breath. These parameters then can be broken down into infant, child, and adult recommendations, with the relative differences in rate, tidal volume, and inspiratory time carefully monitored. By multiplying rate and volume together, you get the minute ventilation, and the goal of ventilation in a pre-hospital setting is to deliver the same minute ventilation throughout the transport. We just assume that it's uniform from arrival to the patient's bed to the hospital. But we find out there's impediments, there's steps, there's landings, there's difficulty, where there's periods where there might be 10, 30 seconds where we can't ventilate. One of the things that the automatic uh, transport ventilators can provide is at least taking that part of the equation uh, out, simplifying it by doing it automatically for the rescuer. You may be asking, how effective is the automatic ventilator during CPR? And why should I use it? I think there's no question that a device such as an automatic transport ventilator would be provide more uniform oxygenation and ventilation. And it's very easy to adjust your compressions to when the ventilator cycles. I mean, that's easy to do in any given patient if for some reason you have on the spot a concern about it. Secondly, it really is not a practical concern because even if there is overlap, the device will deliver an adequate volume. There's some evidence that not synchronizing ventilation and compression may be superior. But the key point is, is that once the patient is intubated, it is not necessary to pause after every five compressions for ventilation. Actually, the Heart Association standards have stated since 1974 or 1980 that ventilation and compression do not have to be synchronized once the patient is intubated. Never before has this control of volume been possible in pre-hospital care and is currently not available using mouth-to-mask, bag mask, or demand valve resuscitators. As a doctor or a paramedic, you want to be in the position of doing your best job possible. But your best effort must be measured against the effectiveness of your current equipment. We've all been through this before. Every five to six years, the Heart Association comes out with new standards. They come out with standards for drug dosages and for defibrillation. And this will continue to happen as new scientific evidence develops. The big difference now is that for the first time, we have both the technology to improve ventilation and the scientific evidence to back it up. So for the first time, we're going to be able to provide our patients with the best ventilatory care possible. We no longer can be thinking about just Cadillac ambulances of the 60s. We have to think about intensive care units on wheels. There's nothing more basic to providing care to victims of illness and injury than ventilation. It's time to really use the technology available to guarantee oxygenation and ventilation to all of our patients. Your job is to save lives, and anything that helps you perform better strengthens your patient's likelihood of survival. You have now seen the automatic ventilator at work. You've also seen it compared to other equipment presently in use. And you're now aware that the automatic transport ventilator is recommended by the American Heart Association over the use of a bag mass resuscitator. We encourage you to test an automatic ventilator for yourself. And you be the judge of its effectiveness. The major advantage of the ATV is that as a paramedic, now you can spend your time evaluating the patient. You can look at the patient. You become more aware of changes that are occurring and then you can go back and set the ventilator accordingly. In a way, it gives you an extra body there, and that, in a sense, can be a tremendous advantage under field condition where personnel resources are limited. It does free up a pair of hands for other things, and yet it assures 
the operator that ventilation is being held constant. That's what we're looking for. You really have to treat that patient with the same sophisticated care that they would get in an intensive care unit. We can do this with a new technology. We chose the ATV in our hospital because it did offer the opportunity to assure good uh, ventilation, good control over ventilation, much the same as we have in the intensive care. Anybody that's been involved in the fire service knows that firefighters can be very skeptical about change. This is the only device that we've put out in the street with all the medical uh, tools and adjuncts that we've brought along in the last couple of years that we've had 100% acceptance. Once we went to the training session, it took a period of 15 minutes to learn the automatic ventilator and how it's used. The explanation is very easy. Anybody can use it. It's, you want it, you need to have it. This program was made possible by funding from Life Support Products. For further information on pre-hospital ventilation or a copy of this program, call 1-800-225-4577.